The internet is interesting. It really helps us place animals, and it can also help give educational messages. If you have websites, you can talk about volunteering. You can talk about any kind of um, programs that you may want to promote, and then you can also use it to help adopt animals. We have a, um, um, oh, what do you call it? It's a lawn care company for, that's pet safe, a natural solutions it's called. And they actually like us so much that they have put a link on their website to our site so people can, their customers can come and look to adopt animals. So there's just so many ways of partnering. We can all look at places in which to post animals. And of course, Pet Finder is a nationally known website, and uh, most shelters will link to it from their site. So there's, with the, with the rise of the internet, we get a lot of complaints online now. A lot of things happen online. So we all have to move and use technology to the best of our ability. They're scraps. But advertising, we use press releases like crazy. Our local Humane Society goes, how do you people get in the paper and on TV all the time? Well, we send out press releases <laughs> because every news place loves the animal story. I mean, animal stories get the most comments, whether it's in print or in film. Um, the most feedback that news agencies get is when they print and do publish an animal story of some sort. And of course, they want viewers. And if animal stories you know, bring viewers, then that's what they're going to do. So when you have an event, you have an issue, you have a cause, contact your local media. You'd be surprised, especially if you always allow them a photo opportunity, how much good press that you can get. And, and you, sometimes you can build relationships. And uh, like the Spokes and Review was doing a story on pit bulls because unfortunately we had some pit bull attacks. So you know the media gets on that and they chew on it worse than a pit bull chews on anything. And they can't let it go. But what I do is I try to bridge. When somebody calls me about a message that I don't think is that important, you know, you do have to probably do the story. But I try to bridge to a more important message, like there's a leash law. You know, if people follow the leash law, we won't have problems with any dogs. And, or, you know, pet licensing or whatever, the, the, or adopt at the animal shelter or whatever the message is. And then if you build those relationships, the same reporter that wanted to do the pit bull story, I got him to do a great story in our dog park the next week. I'm like, hey, I got a great story idea if you need one. And he called me three days later and said, okay, I think I'll use that for next week. So we got, you know, a huge, huge article. Two, went over two pages, had two pictures. One was, you know, an 8 by 10 picture in a newspaper on our dog park. It was fantastic. So don't be afraid to use the media. They can help you educate, and they can help you get your messages out. It's huge. Working with the community. You know, Nancy used to think she could do it alone, and Nancy finally realized that you can't. You have to have the community buy-in. You have to work with other groups. You have to work with people. And they have to help you make your goals happen. And that is huge as we work as a solution for a new tomorrow. The community is the most pivotal piece and the missing piece of the puzzle in the animal world. Local animal rescue groups. I remember early on, I used to think some of them were fanatical. And I was probably not as, able, as willing to work with them as, as I thought. And I don't know, I was shooting myself in the foot when I was doing that. And I finally woke up and I said, why am I fighting these people. I need to align myself with these people. I need to work with them. I need to train them and educate them on what we're doing and how they can fit into our puzzle. And you know, our local groups, we have a woman, Mag Schaefer in Spokane County, who's responsible for saving thousands of dogs because she was persistent in bugging me and helping me get animals on the internet. And she established an out of area agency transfer program and she's still uh, active today. She, just There's some phenomenal people out there in the community they can really, really help make what you do. The AKC clubs, we have an AKC representative and our Friends of Pets Coalition. Um, just a lot of things you can do that will make your job easier and allow you to help animals. We transferred 1,200 animals out of our 7,500 animals to the Seattle area last year. For some reason, they're low on animals, so hey, we're happy to help them. What we found out is uh, Seattle, it, you know, it's kind of a metro area, and you, when people live in close proximity, a lot of times that builds more responsible pet ownership. 
And what they do when in their shelters now is only they're really bad dogs. So they love Spokane dogs because we still have good dogs in our shelter. So they come and, they, and we send those Spokane dogs over and they get adopted right away versus their more problematic dogs over there. So they, they have room to absorb extra animals. I hope that we're in that position someday. But 1,200 animals is huge. And we have a volunteer network we work with called, called Paws Across the Northwest that helps us get those animals out. And it's awesome. A coalition. I formed a coalition, Friends of Pets Coalition, in about 2001. I actually formed it because I wanted the Maddie's Fund grant. How many are familiar with that at all? It's very hard to get. I figure it's last man standing, and I'm still standing. And if they don't give me the Maddie's Fund grant this year, I'm going down there. <laughs> because I have, we have filled out, as a coalition, I can't even tell you how many applications. I mean, we first we formed the coalition because they wanted coalitions to apply. And then by the time we redid our application 50 times, then they changed their rules, and they wanted the lead group to be a no-kill um, established facility. Well, of course, I'm in a motion and mission shelter, and we have killing. So, um, but we did have a rescue group with a 10-year history called Partners for Pets. So they became the lead applicant. And then we started reapplying again with the Friends of Pets Coalition as the silent partner behind the rescue group. Um, and then uh, PeopleSoft had a takeover issue, so Maddie's Fund stopped giving money for a while. Then they came back up and. Uh, we kept reapplying, and then they were busy in New York and stuff. And so finally, we actually just changed our lead agency again to our local Humane Society, which in 2006 did not have to kill an adoptable animal for space. But they don't do animal control. They are just an owner release facility. And they're a very strong lead organization for this grant. And just last week, we were awarded the starter grant in Spokane County for Maddie's Fund. So. <laughs> Well, now we still have to get the big one, but I figure our foot is in the door. It's well in the door, so hopefully um, we move ahead. So we're very excited. Of course, if you're not familiar with the grant, I will get no money from the grant. The grants, my agency will not. The grant goes strictly to the rescue groups to make them more successful, to help them grow, and then they take an more animals out of the shelter. So we'll get more animals out of the shelter alive, and placed, and that's, that's huge. So it's a benefit to me in the long run, but you know, we've been doing a lot of work, and it's, it's not about you know, the individual agencies when you're a coalition. It's about the goals. And so we're really excited um, that we're on the trail. Hopefully you'll be seeing something in the news about us getting, getting the big kahuna. Laws and public policy. Um, we've had several law adjustments over the years. We, like I say, we added the surcharge. Um, to pet licenses, which was probably the most significant thing we've done. Um, we just had to add some new rules for the dog park, so if there was a problem and people broke the laws, there would be some kind of a, a punishment associated with that. Um, I believe in fairness, and I talked at the last NAIA uh, conference in Cincinnati about dangerous dog laws, and I am very much against breed-specific laws. There's some lobbying right now for a pit bull ban because we've had some pit bull issues um, in Spokane County, but we do have in Washington State some very strong dangerous dog laws and potentially dangerous dog laws that give us a way if an animal causes a problem, um, with, a, with some kind of a bite or attack or uh, doing something to another animal that we can either deem it potentially dangerous or dangerous. Uh, we can impose certain restrictions on those animals and hopefully uh, by doing that protect the public um, you know, from, from further injury or other animals um, from further being threatened by those. So it's very important to have a fair image and to not, you know, to give good customer service. Just because you're in an enforcement mode doesn't mean that you have to not think of others, to not give the customer service, to not show some kindness and some reasonableness. I mean, not everyone that breaks the law is going to get a ticket. A ticket is not a solution. A solution is uh, counseling, education, behavior modification, whatever it is. I mean, barking is probably one of the biggest problems. You can write a person a ticket all you want for a barking dog, but it doesn't stop the dog from barking. I mean, what stops the dog from barking is giving that dog owner some tools that they can use to make an adjustment in their animal's behavior. 
I mean, behavior modification is huge. I'm lucky enough, and I'm paying for it with donation dollars, to have a woman on staff that's a PhD animal behaviorist. It's probably the greatest thing that we have ever gotten at Scraps was this woman, and she's been there two years now. Uh, she is internationally known. She's been on Good Morning America and CNN. Um, she is just fantastic. Have anyone heard of the uh, laughing dog research? She, uh, it's sounds that dogs make when, when they're having fun. It's a laughing sound, and uh, she's made a CD of that, and it's, it's really amazing. We play it in the shelter, and it's really had a calming effect on shelter animals and helps them present better as far as adoption. But having a fair public image and being a professional, you're really ahead of the game. We pride ourselves at Scraps on hiring um, people that are career. We don't have hardly any turnover, and a lot of agencies, you know, they turn it over all the time. But when you keep the same people, um, for the most part, then they take some pride and ownership in what they do. Every day, people come into our shelter, and they're like, wow, it's so clean, it's so nice. And we just get so many compliments, and it's because we're professionals. Part of that, we have an advantage over nonprofit because we are government. The one thing about government and being a government employee is you're generally paid at least, and you're not going to make money like my little brother does um, but uh, in the private sector, but you're going to be paid what I would call a living wage, and you're going to have a decent benefits package. So it's easier to hold people. These humane societies do animal control by contract or even just sheltering. Um, you know, they just struggle so much in keeping people because they can't pay them enough. And so it's really hard. So we're lucky in that respect. Um, but we also learn to do more with less. And my husband said, you're not going to talk about that at the conference, are you? Design on a dime? And well, that's part of what we do. Part of what we do is thinking outside the box. Um, I work long days and um, and a pretty busy person. So when I come home, if I watch any TV at all, which I, I'm not a big TV person, I, I watch, and my husband just, I've dragged him into it to some extent, but the Home and Garden Channel, and just mindless stuff so that you can not really think about it and you can go change the washer and dryer loads or something, come back in 10 minutes and you really haven't missed anything. So I've looked at this and I've started applying some of this to our shelters. One of the challenges we face is how to keep up to date. Typically, shelters are, are often kind of dark and dingy and dungeon-like, and so how can you make the best of what you have? Um, so I've looked a little bit at that, and we've come up with some fun solutions. One of the first things we do is we look and try to look at it with fresh eyes and see at how the public looks. That's the same of any of our workplaces. We go in, we see it every day, we, we don't see the clutter, we don't see uh, the shabbiness, we don't see things. So going in with fresh eyes and even just cleaning and organizing can make a huge difference in a facility. Um, adding a little bit of color and paint. We just recently painted um, our back wall orange um, for the ASPCA Mission Orange Project, which um, it's, it's no one's supposed to know, but we've been selected as the fifth Mission Orange community. But don't tell anybody. They're, that's through their national shelter outreach, which they've given us grants for veterinary care. They gave us a grant so we can establish our play yard. Um, and their, this program is designed to help communities and the euthanasia of adoptable pets. And they, they bring their wallet and they bring training. And it, it's really going to be huge. So we kind of went orange for that. But uh, you can have artists donate. And you can do a lot of things um, to brighten up to make it a little bit homey, to get some greenery, get some light, get some, we got wind socks. We have, a, now we have in our cat room, we have a video for cats. They watch this video of like little mice running by and little birds chirping and they're like, oh, look at that, look at that. But they can all see it from their cage. We have it mounted up on the wall. So uh, it has some little music. So there's a lot of things that you can do uh, to add some interest to a facility, um, murals. Uh, just little little decorations. Uh, I have a staff person, she'll decorate stuff seasonally. We just have our spring decorations up now. It just kind of brightens the place. So we got to get rid of those snowflakes. I'm ready, ready to move on. So there's a lot of things um, we can do in that respect. Signage is important so that people know uh, where they are and uh, know what you're all about. So there's a lot of things we can do. We can do pet licensing, our microchipping, um, our huge, our affordable spay-neuter program, so folks that, that want to or need to get their animal spayed or neutered, they can. 
educational outreach. Can't say enough about that. Got to have the education and the community buy-in and support, and of course, fairness in laws and public policy. There's really nothing that we can't do, and we, we just have to really put our heart and soul into it. My uh, son is uh, in his first, I have two kids. My daughter just graduated from Gonzaga, which I mentioned. My son is in his first year at college. He's going to the community college because they asked him to be on the men's basketball team, and he's had a lifetime love of basketball, as I have had, and early on, I think it was starting at fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, um, when he was in fourth grade, he was at a summer basketball camp in the, at the high school. And the high school coach called me and he said, your son and his friend are two of the best kids in this camp. He says, you've got to get them on an AAU basketball team. I'm like, well, what's that? I've heard of YMCA ball and stuff. And he said, well, that's, you know, kind of an elite basketball league, and, and it'll be a huge experience, and it'll prepare them for a high school basketball program. Of course, this is the high school coach, so he wants to, you know, recruit the youth. It's like educating the youth. He wants these youth to know how to play basketball so he can reap the results when they get to high school age. So I, so I said, well, how do you get on a team? Well, go down to the AAU office. So I went down, I put my son Dylan's name on the list, and we waited and waited and waited. No one ever called. No coach ever called and wanted to pick him up. So it became a week before the end of uh, the, the team uh, selection time. And so I went down there, and, and I said, no one ever called. And they said, well, he's on the list. And so the coach called me up, and I said, well, I can't get him on a team. No one seems to want to pick him up. And he said, would you consider coaching a team? And I was like, no. <laughs> Are you kidding me? He says, well, come on. I will help you. I will train you on the high school's offense and defense. And basketball was my sport. And I have played rec league, so I'm not unfamiliar with the sport. But this was a whole new realm for me. And I was like, no, I can't. I can't possibly do this. He says, well, your son needs to be on a team. And that's the only way. I will help you. So the sucker right here on my forehead uh, walked, went down to the AAU office, found out teams cost $1,000 paid the $100 deposit, then had to go find sponsors and all this kind of stuff and get players. And the coach gave me a few other names, the kids from the camp. And then my son had a lot of friends because they played basketball in, in grade school at that point. And we formed this raggedy team. And so we went to practice. And I got this one guy's dad to be the assistant coach. And he was pretty good on the technique, so it was a big help for me. And I was more of the organizer and the motivator. But although I you know, was able to contribute some in the other realm, and we started practicing, and we had that team together for four years, and in four years we were 44 and four. And, we, and I was the only woman coach in the boys' league, and no, no other men liked me. <laughs> and it was a blast. The first year we went in, we took third. The second year we took first, and the, and the next two years we took second, and those years, each time we met this one, it was a select team from all different schools, and it was a very athletic team where all our school team was from the same school district. So we didn't cherry pick people, but we had heart. And what we learned is we, we didn't have uh, Michael Jordan on the team, we didn't have a Shaquille O'Neal, but we had heart. We had some basic athletic athleticism in the team but we had heart. And what I told those boys is you, every time you go out there, you play as a team because life is a team sport and so is basketball. You play as a team, you work together, you be strong in yourself, and you do everything like you mean it. I had this big guy, and he was a, he's a, well, actually, he's a football player in college now. He's a, the no-neck guy, 6'2", you know, 240 pounds. 250-pound high school kid he turned out to be. And, you know, he was a little block of wood <laughs> in those days. And, you know, I said, are you kidding me? You're not the tallest kid out there, but you're the biggest. No one's going to fight. You know, you just, poof, get the rebound. And, you know, he just taught those guys to go up and be strong in themselves. And with that strength and with that team mentality and, of course, good defense, we won a championship, and we were a team to be reckoned with. And people are still hopefully talking about the future knights and the crazy lady that was cheerleading on the side. So what it shows is that we can be strong in ourselves, we can do everything we do with courage, and we can make a difference and be part of the solution for the new tomorrow. There is a point when you cannot walk away, when you have to stand up straight and tall and mean the word you say, there is a point you must decide. If to do it cause it's right, that's when you become a point of life. There is a no. 
darkness And everyone must face It wants to take what's good and better Laid on the waste And that darkness Covers everything inside Until 